Thank you, everyone, for your patience. At this time, I would like to turn things over to Professor Carla Murdoch, who is going to introduce tonight's guest speaker and topic. Thanks, Patrick. Welcome, everyone. I'm Carla Murdoch, director of the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics, and I have the privilege of helping to host this webinar with Catherine Hayhoe as part of the Mudd Center's Daily Ethics Lecture Series. The Daily Ethics series is designed to help us contemplate how our individual choices and habits each day express or ought to express our most important personal values. Hosting our session with me today are Omar Quinones, postdoctoral fellow at the Mudd Center, and Lisa Greer, professor of geology. Professor Greer is chair of the WNL Sustainability Committee, a core faculty member in the Environmental Studies Program and a researcher who studies coral reef health. I'd also like to thank Patrick Sheridan, who's managing all the technological aspects of this webinar. With that, I'm happy to introduce Professor Catherine Hayhoe, an atmos atmospheric scientist who wears many hats. She is chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, and at Texas Tech University, she is the Paul Whitfield Horn Distinguished Professor the Political Science Endowed Chair in Public Policy and Public Law, and an Associate in the Public Health Program of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Professor Hayhoe's research assesses the regional to local scale impacts of climate change on human systems and the natural environment. And this work has been funded by the Department of Interior and the National Science Foundation, among other sources. She was a lead author for the United States' second, third, and fourth national climate assessments. In order to bring climate science into the public discourse, Professor Hayhoe has led by example. Her most recent book, released in September, is called Saving Us, a climate scientist's case for hope and healing in a divided world. Her 2018 TED Talk has been viewed millions of times, and she's been named a United Nations Champion of the Earth and one of Times Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. Professor Hayhoe's public-facing work is informed by her Christian faith, and she serves as the Climate Ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. She co-wrote the book, A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions, and she hosts the PBS digital series called Global Weirding, Climate, Politics, and Religion. I could go on and on about Professor Hayhoe's accomplishments, but I know you would like to hear from her. So with that, I'll pass the baton. Thanks for being with us here today, Professor Hayhoe. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. It is great to be with you here today. And it will be great to speak with you as well. So as I go through my presentation, as you heard, you are going to have the chance to give us questions. You're gonna be doing this using Poll Everywhere, which you can go to on your phone or your computer or your tablet or anything that connects to the internet. P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash Catherine. You have to spell Catherine with two A's, K-A-T-H-A. R-I-N-E, uh, or you can click in the link that I put in the chat, or you can go to polyv.com and enter Catherine with two A's. You don't have to enter your name, just push skip. And when you do, there's actually a question waiting for you there. And a few people have already started to answer it. So I wanna know, who are you? Are you a student? Are you a faculty or staff member? Are you alum or are you a community member, which could be um, from the local community or really from anybody where, because you can be joining in online. So it looks like our students got off to the quickest start there. The vast majority of people here are students, but we also have a fair number of faculty and staff. Oh, we got a couple of community members coming up too. Good. Oh, we have an alum. Okay, excellent. Keep it coming. Oh, the faculty and staff are getting there. I know usually what happens is students are a lot faster on this, and then we sort of catch up with you afterwards. So faculty and staff are rising to that 10%. And let's see, students are holding steady at 89 or 87%. And we have one or two alum and one or two community members. Okay, 
Now I'm going to ask you one more question. And this question you have to answer with a word. Only one word, not two words, just one word. But you can pick any word. Ready? This next question is, what is the most extreme weather event you have experienced? Was it a flood, a hurricane, a storm, a blizzard? Oh, we got a typhoon right away. A twister, a tornado. Um, what is the most extreme weather you have experienced? And as you can see, this is why it had to be one word is because it's a wordle. And the more people who say, and sorry, not wordle, like the game wordle, but <laughs> where you have a word cloud. And the more people who say the word, the bigger it is. And so a lot of you have experienced a hurricane. Quite a few of you have experienced a blizzard or a flood. There's derechos, there's stand storms, the polar vortex, tornadoes, droughts, wildfires, floods, ice storm, extreme wind. Whiteouts, yeah, I've seen plenty of those myself. Hail, lots of different extremes. And this was an easy question to answer, wasn't it? That's because our brains are built to remember weather. Weather is that crazy hurricane or flood or sandstorm we live through, but our brains are not built to experience climate. Climate is the long-term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. And we can immediately think of a weather event we've experienced. But if I asked you, how is climate changing in the place where you live? You'd have to add up all of the temperature for 30 years and fit a trend line to it. Most of us cannot do that on the fly. Okay, so from now on, as I go through my presentation, this is going to stay open. And what this is, is this is how you can ask questions. And we're going to take your questions at the end. But here's the fun part. We don't have time to take all of them. So we're going to take the questions with the most up votes. So you can put your question in here, but even if you don't have a question, go there and keep an eye on the other questions and upvote the questions you most want answered. Because when we get to the end, we'll look at the questions that have most been upvoted. And you can do this at any time. So I was asked to speak on environmental ethics and what we can do at the global scale, at the regional scale, and at the individual level. So whenever I talk about a topic, I like to start at the beginning. What is an environmentalist? So if you go to Google, as I did, it says someone who is concerned with or advocates for the protection of the environment. And synonyms are conservationist, preservationist, ecologist, green, or nature lover. Okay. Then you look at the next set of synonyms. Eco-activist, eco-nut, eco-freak, tree hugger? That doesn't sound so good. How did somebody who cares about the environment end up with these relatively derogatory names? And then I ask, well, who, who are environmentalists? And when you go to Google, and I did this a little while ago, and you type in environmentalist, these are the pictures that show up. And I don't know about you, but I don't really see myself in these pictures because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people, right? One is a woman, just one out of the eight. Oops, sorry. Not only that, but one, two, three, four, five are not alive anymore. One, two, three, four have large beards and all of them are white. So environmentalist seems like something that all white, mostly dead, mostly men with large beards do, and the rest of us might not. The reality is, and I love this article from Grist, they said, the problem is environmentalism has been successfully cast as a fringe concern, rather than the basic universal right of every man, woman, and child to have a safe and healthy air, water, food, land, sea, and natural places. Not to mention economies based on security and sustainability rather than corporate profit and destruction. That's a pretty all-encompassing definition of environmentalism. And I believe that the most dangerous myth that we've bought into is that we only care about the planet if we're a certain type of person. And if we wouldn't consider ourselves to be a tree hugger or even worse, an eco-nut, as that definition said, then we're not the right type of person. But here's the thing. Can anybody float around in outer space without the resources our planet provides? We depend on this amazing planet for everything that keeps us alive. 
no matter who we are, no matter where we live, no matter what's important to us, no matter how we vote, we depend on the air this planet gives us to breathe, the water to drink, the food to eat, everything that provides for our health and well being comes from this planet. So I would redefine environmentalist as not necessarily a certain type of person. I would define it as simply a human being who lives in planet Earth. Because without this planet, we cannot survive. Now, a number of years ago, I was very fortunate to be able to attend and have a front row seat at one of Stephen Hawking's last talks that he gave before he passed away. And as you might know, by the end of his life, he was a famous cosmologist, but by the end of his life, he spoke very eloquently on the urgency of climate action. And so he was speaking about the climate crisis and how urgent it was that we act. And then he said something that made my jaw just drop. I, he said, and that's why, because climate change is so serious, he said, that's why we might have to terraform Mars. I said to myself, what? In order to terraform Mars, and this is a picture from the movie, The Martian, it's not an actual person on Mars, <laughs> to terraform Mars, there is no way we will be able to do that before climate change overwhelms our civilization if we don't fix it. So at the same science festival the next day, I was speaking with a friend and a colleague of Stephen Hawking's, Lord Martin Rees, who's the Royal Astronomer of England. And so I said to him, I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And he said, no, go ahead. And I said, do you agree with Hawking that we need to terraform Mars to escape from climate change? And he laughed, he said, oh no, he said, Steve and I are old friends, but fixing climate change is a dawdle in the park compared to terraforming Mars. That was a mic drop if I'd ever heard one. The truth is to care about a changing climate, we only have to be one thing. And that one thing is a human living on planet earth and we are all that. We often think of this world as looking down on it from space and all we see is nature. We see the blue of the ocean, we see the green of the land, we see the brown of the deserts, we see the white of the clouds. But I think increasingly the most accurate way to look at the earth is the way it appears not during the day, but during the night. This is a real picture, a real photograph, a, a time exposure of what the earth looks like at night. And what do you see? What stands out? Us, people. You see our lights, you see our cities, you see our roads. This is our planet today. It is no longer an untouched, pristine globe. It is covered in people. And our influence on the planet began quite some time ago. Back in the 1300s, Back in London, this is a woodcut of the Tower of London back in the 1300s. That was where the King and the Queen of England were in residence when they were in London. And people were burning so much coal within the city limits that the air pollution in London was so bad that King Edward III, that, and this is back in the 1300s, declared that when his queen was in residence, Queen Eleanor, no one was allowed to burn coal within the city limits of London on pain of death. That was the first air quality legislation in the world that we know of. And that's what, how humans were already affecting the planet. Then moving ahead, it turns out that the mass of air pollution that we produce doesn't just choke our lungs, it is quite literally dimming the planet by putting up all these particles that reflect the sun's energy back to space, causing surface solar radiation to go down. It's been dimming the sun's energy. Then there were the nuclear experiments and the nuclear explosions during World War II. And many early climate modelers in my own field were very concerned about the possibility of nuclear winter, plunging the entire planet into a nuclear winter from massive nuclear explosions. Then back when I was little, we had these things in our spray cans and also in our Nike Air shoes, believe it or not, and in our air conditioners and our refrigerators that it turned out were these human-made chemicals that built up in the upper atmosphere and started to destroy our ozone. And so in the 1980s, scientists found the ozone hole, a giant hole in our protective ozone layer that was massively increasing skin ca cancer levels because the ozone layer is what protects us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. 
And then now today, we've realized that when we burn all of this coal and gas and oil, we're producing heat trapping gases that are causing our planet to warm and that are building up in the ocean, making it more acidic. So we humans are having a tremendous impact on almost every aspect of our planet. It's truly not an overstatement to say that we're conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home that we have, and we can no longer plead ignorance. We know what we're doing. And why do we care about it again? Because it affects every single one of us. All you have to be is a human to be impacted by these changes. So I'm going to focus on one specific way that we're impacting our planet. And it is arguably the biggest way because it is, as the US military calls it, a threat multiplier. This is taking all of our other challenges, our biodiversity crisis, our lack of access to resources, crises like poverty and hunger and disease, and even economic and political instability, and it's making them worse. And this problem is our dependence on fossil fuels and the climate change that results. Fossil fuels have brought us tremendous benefits. Our industrialized society was built on fossil fuels that doubled our lifespan, gave us electricity, cars, airplanes, all kinds of conveniences of modern life. But just like medicines also often have side effects, so too do fossil fuels. And whether we are extracting them, whether we are burning them, or whether we are dealing with the after effects of the heat trapping gases they produce, we are recognizing today that the side effects are here. So first of all, when we extract fossil fuels, it is a dirty, polluting process. There are carcinogenic chemicals, there are oil spills, it affects the health of mothers and babies, um, mountaintop removal coal mining poisons our waterways. Extracting fossil fuels is a very dirty and very harmful process. Then when we burn the fossil fuels, it produces air pollution the smog that we see sitting over big cities. This air pollution causes millions of deaths a year. This estimate of 9 million is actually up now. It's up to 10 million a year, which is double the number of COVID deaths from air pollution every single year. That's just air pollution. We're not talking about climate change. We're just talking about the stuff you breathe in. It isn't equitable or fair. People who live in lower income neighborhoods and lower income countries are disproportionately exposed to air pollution compared to people who live in higher income neighborhoods in the same city or higher income countries. And there's even an interaction with COVID. If our lungs have been exposed to air pollution for a long period of time, and then we're exposed to COVID, we're more likely to get it and we're more likely to get very sick and even die because of air pollution making us more vulnerable to COVID. And last year, for example, in Chicago, they noticed that there was a much higher death rate for Black Americans, um, especially living in Chicago, they, they were studying, um, and people who had been exposed to air pollution. What's the connection? The connection is that a lot of brown and Black neighborhoods in the US are lower income and they're exposed to greater levels of air pollution. And then along comes COVID and it interacts with and exacerbates the impact on their lungs. So extraction and combustion are already inequitable and are already har harmful, but then we have climate change. And that is what I study. What is climate change? Well, it's a complicated topic, but you can explain it in three little cartoons. And we've known the basics since the 1800s. So our planet, there's our happy planet, has a natural blanket of heat trapping gases. It's entirely natural. The sun's energy shines down and goes through this blanket, like through a window, and then the earth heats up and gives off heat energy. And just like a blanket traps your body heat on a cold night, the earth's blanket traps the earth's heat, keeping us over 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we would be otherwise. And that's a good thing. We'd be a frozen ball of ice if it weren't for this amazing natural blanket. We've known about this natural blanket since the work of Joseph Fourier in the 1820s. That's how long we've known about the natural blanket. But when we dig up and burn coal back then and oil and gas today and burn it, it produces even more heat trapping gases that are, rapid, that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet that it did not need. 
And just like you would if somebody snuck into your room and put an extra blanket on you, in the same way, the earth is heating up and it's saying, hey, who's putting this extra blanket on me? I don't need this. How long have we known about the extra blanket? Since the 1850s. This man, John Tyndale, connected mining of coal with production of heat trapping gases. And Mrs. Eunice Foote, who was a, a scientist living in upstate New York in 1856, published a paper, and we don't have a known photograph of her. There's lots of photographs on the internet that say they're her, but they're actually her daughters. So no actual photograph of her. But she did this study in 1856, where she actually said if carbon dioxide was higher, the planet would be warmer in 1856. And then by the 1890s, we knew enough science that Svante Arrhenius, who was a Swedish chemist, who was actually a distant cousin of Greta Thunberg's, he calculated exactly how much the planet would warm if we kept on using massive amounts of fossil fuels, or if we didn't. He calculated it by hand in the 1890s, and the answers he got were very similar to our most powerful supercomputers today. So we've known for more than 100 years that these heat trapping gases in the atmosphere are the thermostat of the planet, that burning coal and gas and oil produces more of them. That's why the planet is warming. And so I would argue even further that the most accurate picture of our planet is not the planet from space during the day where you just see nature, but today, because we humans are in control of the future of our planet, not just through pollution, but through climate change, I would argue the most accurate picture of our planet is this. Our planet is quite literally in our hands. Its future and our future is up to us. And that is why it is so important to be talking about these issues because every single one of us is affected by them. And every single one of us can be part of the solution. So let's talk a little bit about how climate change is affecting us. What is it actually doing to us? Well, the planet's getting warmer, yes. But what's also happening is not just global warming, but global weirding. I asked you earlier, what's a extreme weather event you've experienced? And everybody's experienced at least one. Some people have experienced many of them. Wherever you live, it's like we have a pair of weather dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six, a heat wave, a hurricane, a drought, an extreme event, right? We always have a chance of rolling that double six naturally, totally naturally. So where does climate change come in? Often it's like it's sneaking in and taking one of these numbers and turning it into a six and then taking another number and turning it into a six and then taking another number and turning it into a seven. And all of a sudden we're rolling more and more extreme events and we're saying, how could this happen? This isn't normal. It isn't. It's global weirding. As climate change loads the weather dice against us, we're seeing our heat waves get stronger. We're seeing our droughts get longer. We're seeing our wildfires burn greater area. We're seeing our hurricanes become stronger and dumping a lot more rainfall on us. Wherever you live across the United States, we see billion dollar weather and climate disasters all the time. And you can see Texas is actually number one because we have a lot of people and a lot of disasters. Virginia is a pretty dark pink over there. We know these happen naturally, but back when they started keeping these records back in the 1980s, there was on average one event every four months, one every four months. You know how many there are now? There's one every three weeks. That's climate change loading the weather dice against us. And where you live in Virginia, which I know well, since all of my in-laws are from Virginia and I spend quite a bit of time there, we're seeing our heavy rainfalls getting more frequent because warmer air holds more water vapor. And so when a storm comes along, as it always does, there's more water vapor for that storm to sweep up and dump on us today than there was 50 or 100 years ago. That's global weirding. We do see heat waves are stronger and more frequent. We see sea level rises accelerating. I don't know if you saw a recent story on how the basement archives in the Smithsonian Museum and the mall in DC are flooding because of sea level rise. And yes, our hurricanes are getting more dangerous because they're powered by warmer ocean waters and they are being supercharged by climate change. 
Why do we care about these issues? Because it isn't just about the planet, it's about us. It's affecting our infrastructure, our water, our food, our health. We care about climate change because it affects every aspect of our lives as humans. It affects the safety of our homes. It affects national security. It affects our economy. It affects our health. It affects our food and our water. Climate change is not a standalone issue. Climate change is what makes every other issue more challenging. Like what? Like updating our infrastructure, building our economy, ensuring people have access to energy. It's complicated by climate change loading the weather dice against us. Making sure people have access to clean water, which not everybody does, not even in this country. Access to natural resources, maintaining our health, available food, protecting our biodiversity and conserving nature, and issues of justice and equity. Climate change touches on and impacts every single one of these. So this begs a question. Why are we not treating this like an emergency then? And let me remind you about questions. You can put your questions in pollev.com slash Catherine at any time. And you can check the questions other people have and upvote the ones you most want answered too. Don't forget to do that. But we still have a little while to go. Why aren't we treating this like an emergency? People say people just need to know more scary facts about climate change. But the more scary facts we know, the more we detach. It's because as humans, we're really good at something called psychological distance. We're really good at seeing risks as being far away in time or space or being abstract rather than concrete or not relevant to me. You know, it's relevant to those environmentalist tree huggers, people might think, rather than any human living on this planet. I mean, by definition, you have to be an environmentalist if you live on this planet, but we don't think of it that way. And I even have data to show this. So this is a map of the whole U.S. It's from the Yale Program in Climate Communication. If you want to Google it afterwards, you can zoom in on your county and you can zoom in on your congressional district. Anywhere that people said more than 50% of people said yes is orange. Anywhere less than 50% of people said yes is blue. So orange means agreeing and blue means disagreeing. And the darker orange, the more people agree. So do you think global warming is happening? Most people say yes. Do you think it will harm plants and animals, non-human species? How are those out, uh, distant from us in relevance? They're not humans. Yes. Do you think it will harm future generations distant in time? Yes. Do you think it will harm people who live in those countries over there? Yes. Do you think it will affect you? all of a sudden it's blue. So what do we need to do? We need to show people how whoever they are is the perfect person to care. How climate is changing right now, right here, in concrete ways that affect our lives today. Climate change affects all of us, but here's where the ethical component comes in. It doesn't affect us all equally. Climate change disproportionately affects people who are already marginalized, who are already vulnerable. It affects women and children more than men, especially in low-income countries. It affects indigenous people more than majorities. It affects uh, low-income brown and black neighborhoods more than higher income, wealthier neighborhoods. When disaster strikes, who's most at risk? For example, people who have to work outside or can't afford air conditioning. People who are sick or disabled, who depend on electricity or are more vulnerable to disease. People who live in poverty, people who don't have access to health care. Black and brown neighborhoods and low-income communities that have been redlined for the last hundred years. People who have done the least to contribute to the problem are most at risk, and that's not fair. So when you get a flood in North America and you get a flood in Bangladesh, floods of equal magnitude, yet one has insurance, one has, you know, National Guard, the other has nothing. When you get a drought in Texas versus Syria, same drought. In Texas, $12 billion worth in crop losses. In Syria, a massive refugee crisis with 13 million people displaced within the country, 
over 2 million outside the country. Same drought. When you get Hurricane Matthew hitting North Carolina, catastrophic flooding, 28 deaths, $30 billion worth in damage. Same hurricane hits Haiti, the poorest country in North Central America. Tens of thousands of homes destroyed. Cholera epidemic runs rampant. Whenever we look at who's most vulnerable across the whole world, it is the people who live in the same countries where, so this is a map of climate vulnerability. The black is the more vulnerable. It's people who live in the same countries where there are already high levels of poverty, dark brown. The same countries where there's already high levels of hunger, dark red. The intersection between climate change and all of these global equity issues is clear. And in fact, since the 1960s, climate change has already increased the gap between the richest and poorest people in the world by as much as 25%. It has already happened. The United Nations, just before COVID, warned that climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of development, global health, and poverty reduction. Climate change affects us all, but it affects those who have the least and have contributed to this problem the least, the most, and that's not fair. But here's the interesting thing. When we look at what we need to accomplish, the sustainable development goals, for example, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equity, clean water and sanitation, affordable energy, decent work. Climate change affects all of these. In fact, I would take out number 13. You see number 13 down there, climate action? I would take it out and I would put it over the whole. We can't fix any of these issues if we leave climate change out of the picture because climate change is the hole in the bucket. It's making all of these worse, but climate solutions help with poverty and hunger and health and education. Climate impacts like coastal flooding harm us all, but climate solutions like restoring coastal wetlands benefit us all. Climate solutions help us all, but they can be designed such that they help the poor and the marginalized the most, and that is completely fair. Down here in the lower right, you see a picture of Tony Renato. He's crouching down, looking at a tree. He's a single man who has worked in sub-Saharan Africa for over 40 years to help farmers practice agroforestry, where you plant trees in and around your fields that retain the water and the nutrients and allow you to grow more crops. Today, they are growing enough food to feed 250 million more people in sub-Saharan Africa because of that one man's work. That is what real climate solutions look like. So how do we tackle the climate crisis? I can't end without talking about what do we do? We know what we have to do. We have to stop putting carbon into the atmosphere. We have to start taking it out of the atmosphere and we have to build resilience to the changes that are already happening today. What do these solutions look like? How do we take carbon out of the atmosphere? Well, we often think of transition to clean energy. That's true. Wind, solar, hydroelectric, and more. But efficiency is also important. Through efficiency alone, which means not wasting our energy, we could cut US carbon emissions in half. And did you know that these solutions, efficiency and clean energy solutions and electrifying things as well, they save us money, they create jobs, they create cleaner air. Remember 10 million people a year dying from air pollution? Oh, and they help with climate change too. What do solutions look like that take our carbon out of the atmosphere? Sure, they look like tree planting, but they also include protecting and restoring ecosystems, restoring coastal wetlands, uh, regenerative agricultural practices that put carbon back in the soil where we want it. These solutions enrich our soils, they protect our ecosystems, they filter our water and our air. Oh, and they help with climate change too. They also help to restore things like the bison herds that are being restored now that used to roam the Great Plains and the Nature Conservancy is part of that. And then we need solutions that build resilience, like what? Like greening low income neighborhoods that have been historically redlined, which were racist insurance and lending practices over the last hundred years that left them full of concrete, which means that during a heat wave, low income neighborhoods in the same city are over 10 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than higher income neighborhoods in the same city, which means greater heat stress, greater air conditioning bills and worse. So when we green low income neighborhoods, we are cleaning up their air because trees filter the air. 
We're improving people's health. We're reducing flood risk because we're providing green spaces that soak up the water. We're addressing socioeconomic qualities. Oh, and we're taking up carbon too. There are win, 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 win solutions that help with inequity, that help with jobs, that help with health, that help with flooding, that help with air quality, that help with food. Oh, and they help with climate change too. Climate solutions can give us cleaner air and water. They can protect us from disasters like floods, storms, and wildfires. They can help us grow more crops, provide more affordable energy, reduce our inequalities, make our cities safer, and give us a more stable world. So I want to end because I know the title is about individual too, right? So far, we've talked more about big picture. So I want to end, and you have about four or five more minutes to put your questions in here and to upvote the ones that you want. And you can actually still do, do that while we're getting to the first few questions as well. So that's okay. You can do that then too. But before we end, I want to talk about, well, what's our role in this? And I left you off on this map, which says, do you think climate change will harm you personally? And this is pretty dark blue. But there's one map that's darker blue. You know what that is? Do you ever talk about it? Do you ever talk about it? No. What's the connection? If we never talk about something, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever want to do anything to fix it? So every single one of us has a role to play, and that role does not begin with our light bulbs, our recycling, or our diet. Now, don't get me wrong. I have changed my light bulbs. I recycle, and I've changed our diet. But the most important thing that each one of us can do is to use our voice to share why this matters and what we can do to fix it. And you know what? We scientists, we're messenger number two when it comes to being most effective. The most effective messenger is you, people you know. You are the best person to have that conversation with them. Not Uncle Joe, who's always bringing up articles he read on Facebook about how climate change isn't real, but the 93% of us who are not dismissive, the 70% of us who are worried about climate change, the 50% of us who feel helpless and hopeless and don't know what to do, the only 8% who are activated. The goal is not to change the minds of the Uncle Joes of the world. They're only 8%. The goal is to talk to the 92% of us who are worried, but we don't know what to do. That's where our conversations matter. And it's not about the science. It's not about the ice sheets. It's about how climate change affects us and what we can do to fix it. People ask me, well, okay, but how do you talk about polar bears where I live? I said, well, unless you live in Svalbard, you don't talk about the polar bears. You talk about farming if you live in Texas. You talk about wildfire if you live in California. You talk about flooding if you live on the East Coast or the West Coast. You talk about air pollution if you live near a big city. You talk about sea level rise if you live in Norfolk, Virginia. The goal of the conversation is not to tell people about climate change. It is to expand the number of people in the conversation by helping them see that who they already are is the perfect person to care. Because to care about these issues, you only have to be one thing, and that's a human living on planet Earth. You could be a parent. You could be a birder. You could be a hierarch. Uh, kayaker. You could be a big fan of the Olympics. Did you know that a third of winter Olympic venues are no longer viable already today due to climate change? You could be somebody who's really into, name it, you love good food, you're into beer and wine, you're a member of the Rotary Club. In my book, I actually go through my book, Saving Us, I go through all these different things that you can, you know, you might love beach vacations. Whoever you are, you're the perfect person to care because what you care about is already being affected by climate change. And you can help other people see that too. So that's why when I did my TED talk, I called the, the most important thing you can do to fight climate change is talk about it. And this was not my TED talk at all. But if you want to know more about how to have those conversations, check out my TED talk and check out my book, Saving Us. But the bottom line is this, whoever we are, we care about this planet. Whoever we are, we actually are an environmentalist, whether we claim that label or not. And whoever we are, we do care about climate change because it affects the future of every single one of us on this planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, your work is inspiring and I, and I love your book too. I, I wanted to start with a question. Um, 
it can be really hard to talk about how increasingly dire the situation is with climate change, um, especially when I know that my students, my wonderful students who have chosen to spend the semester talking about climate change with me are the, solu you know, they're the solution makers for this, right? And I really like in your book, how you frame how we might move beyond that fear or that shame of not doing enough. And I was wondering how, if you had some words about how to, how we can make sure that we understand the negatives, but inspire the positive. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And in my book, and again, this was not, this talk was not my book either. <laughs> I was specifically asked to talk about environmental ethics and our actions there. But in my book, the hardest chapter, but I think the most important chapters to write were about fear, guilt, and shame. Because those are the emotions we often feel when we realize just how bad this is and just how every aspect of our life contributes to it. But people often debate, well, do we need individual actions then or do we need system-wide change? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> because why? How does the system change other than by individuals? And how do individuals change a system? By using their voice. By using their voice literally by speaking, by using their voice on social media, by using you know, their voice in terms of how they spend their time, in terms of what we do where others see us doing it, in terms of, especially as you get a bit, a, a bit older, where you, you know, where you bank, where you have your credit card, where you have, you invest your pension funds. And I don't know if you've seen the movie, um, Don't Look Up from Netflix, where there's a comet that's going to hit the earth. So I was actually asked by Netflix to help to co-create their climate action website. And I love it because if you go to the typical climate action website, it will tell you again to, you know, recycle, change your light bulbs, eat a plant-based diet, um, don't fly, um, you know, get around by public transportation. And don't get me wrong, all of those things are good things to do, but they are not going to fix the problem. I've calculated it. And if everybody who cared enough in the U.S. to do something did everything they could, that would only fix 20% of the problem. We need system-wide change and how we, we as individuals initiate system-wide change, how we knock over the first domino of system-wide change is through using our voices because that is how the world has changed before. If we look at how women got the vote, how civil rights were enacted, how apartheid ended in South Africa, all of those changes began when individual people, not even, not big, famous, wealthy, rich, influential people, really ordinary people use their voices to say the world can and must be different. And through using their voices, they attracted other people to the cause. And then they started to influence people who could make decisions. And then they started to get things up there that people had to vote on. And then cities started to do things in states. And then pretty soon it snowballed to the point where the very last people at the top of the pyramid could not ignore anymore what people were saying underneath. So I'm actually gonna show you this website very briefly. And if you wanna find it, you can Google, don't look up, count us in. If you Google, don't look up, count us in, and I'm going to put the link in the chat here, just in case people can see it in the chat as well. But I'm going to share my screen with you so you see what it looks like. You will start by seeing a picture of Leonardo DiCaprio looking anguished, as he should. Love living on Earth, but hate planet killing comets. Ready to stop freaking out and start doing something about, about climate change. What are the top six actions? Talk about it. Join a group of people so you can talk about it together. Make your money count. Keep politicians accountable. I really argued strongly for having spark ideas at school and work because do not count students out, right? You know how to use your voices more than anybody and push for climate headlines. And if you click see all steps down here and you go down, you'll see cut your food waste, eat more veggies, switch to clean energy, get around greener, fly less, be kind to your mind. You'll see these there as well. But if you explore this website, it's actually got a lot of information there and a lot of resources, including my TED Talk and my book, about how we as individuals truly can change the world. And it begins with our voice. And that's where we find our hope. We find our hope in action, not in dooming or glooming or pointing fingers at people and shaming them, but by showing them that who they already are is the perfect person to care and they can be part of the solution too. Thank you so much, Catherine, for uh, so, such a call to action. Um, my question is about in caring as opposed to informing the public. So uh, throughout, throughout your presentation, I was thinking about, about you know, what the, the tools uh, might be for um, to help people, people to care 
for the environment, for their situation. And, uh, how do you see that uh, in relation to your work? Since a lot of people nowadays seem, seem to think information is the, is the problem. Yes. Well, so right now, climate change is one of the most politically polarized issues in the country. And so sometimes you just say the words climate change and people shut off. But as I talk about in my TED talk, if we begin our conversations, not with what we disagree on, but with something we agree on. And if we don't know what we agree on, then find out what it is. You know, do we both love going to the same place? Do we both enjoy reading? Do we both, you know, love the same coffee shop or, or do we both, are we both really into going to the beach? Find out what it is that we have in common, begin the conversation there, connect the dots to talk about, well, you know, I love going to the beach, but I'm really worried because I know sea levels rising. They're having a lot of flooding along the coast. And when I was there, this is what I saw. And they're having to replenish the beaches. And, you know, there's some homes that are starting to be in danger along the coast and, and connect the dots to what people care about. And then always, always offer practical, viable solutions people can get on board with. Because the number one reason people reject the science is because they don't think that we can fix it. So it looks like we have a lot of good questions. Um, so Catherine, you wanna dive in and we'll hear from the audience? Oh, fantastic questions. We've got 33 upvotes, 28 upvotes, 26 upvotes. This is great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go with the first one and then I'm gonna you know, throw it back to you, Carla, and maybe you wanna pick a, another question, but I'll pick number one. And number one is, can we really address the climate crisis and countless other social and environmental crises under capitalism? Um, I am not an economic or political expert. I'm a climate scientist. But being a climate scientist, I will tell you this, we do not have time. We have to fix climate change with exactly what we have today. And here's the really interesting thing. Climate solutions, remember how I was talking about win, 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 win solutions? Climate solutions should and can be designed so they address socioeconomic inequities. They can and should be addressed so they limit the impacts and the rights of corporations on people and their health. They can and should be designed so that they allow for more equitable distribution of resources and a more democratic political process. Climate solutions can actually take us to that better place. But if we wait and say, oh, well, we have to do this first before we fix climate change, it will be too late. We have to start with what we have and we have to make every solution that we have count as a win, 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 win. Over to you, Carla, would you like to choose a question? Uh, sure, I really like uh, this one. I think uh, one of the audience members asks, what do you believe to be the best way to try to talk to, to and educate friends and family who might be climate change deniers? Mm -hmm. Much of the current science tends to be complicated or not accessible to the general populations. Is there a way to simplify the literature? Yes, there is. And that's a great question that you asked. So first of all, I'm going to show you three things that, that answer that question. And then heads up, Omar, I'm going over to you next. You have to pick the next question. <laughs> okay. So the first of all is we aren't really just two groups, believers or deniers. And I talk about this in my book, Saving Us. We're not believers because it's not a religion. The data is clear. The planet's warming and humans are responsible. And when we use the word deniers, it often draws a line in the sand that puts people out who have questions because they've heard disinformation from sources they trust. So instead, I prefer the six Americas of global warming, which is another product of the Yale program on climate communication that created those maps I showed you. And when you look at where people fall, it turns out, you know what? Most of us are worried. Alarmed is the biggest category. Concerned is number two. Cautious is number three. People who are dismissive are only 9%. Now, people who are doubtful or cautious often lead with their doubts. But did you know that sciencey sounding objections to climate change are less than 30 years old? And the science of climate change is over 150 years old? Why are the doubts only 30 years old? Because they were manufactured to try to avoid action. So, what we have to realize is, first of all, we have really good answers to all the science sounding objections because scientists have been asking those questions for over 100 years. And if you go to skepticalscience.com, skepticalscience.com and you go to arguments, 
there's a list of starts at number one and it goes all the way down to number 217 arguments people use to reject climate change. And the most popular one, they're, they're ranked by popularity is it's been warmer before. So if you click here, you get a short answer, you get an, a longer answer, and then you get the full answer with all of the figures and the data and the links to the scientific papers. So, but what we have to realize is is that the biggest objections people have is not to the science, because if they really had a problem with the science, they wouldn't be using airplanes or stoves or fridges either. It's the same science. They don't think we can fix it. And so in my little series, Global Weirding, that I do on YouTube, I have this one video that you want to watch called, If I Just Explain the Facts, They'll Get It, Right? And the answer is no. Because the man who created SkepticalScience.com, John Cook, and I tell the story in my book, his dad was someone who always brought up his doubts about science. So John went back to school and got a PhD in cognitive psychology. He became a world expert in disinformation. He created the skeptical science website with 217 sciencey sounding arguments and answers. And do you think that changed his dad's mind? But his dad's mind did change. And you know how they changed? It changed. When his dad, who's a frugal, thrifty, conservative person, realized he would save a ton of money if he got solar panels. And in fact, the government was running a program where the government would pay you double what you produced and put back into the grid. So he got a few extras and he started to produce his solar energy and he started to make a ton of money. And every time he got his bill and his check, he would send it to John saying, look how much money I've made off my solar panels. All of a sudden, he was part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. And about two years afterwards, he and John were having dinner. And in the course of the conversation, he said, oh, yes, global warming. It's such a serious problem. And I've always thought so. And John said he almost fell off his chair. He was like, what do you mean? You always thought so. His dad's mind had been changed, not by John giving him all the science, but by seeing that he could be part of the solution. And that is how we change people's minds. So check out my TED Talk. Check out my global weirding episode on if I just told them the facts, sure, it'll change their minds. Do check out skeptical science, but realize that the biggest problem is not the science. The biggest problem is people don't think they can fix it. All right, Omar, over to you. All right. Uh, here's a really good question from the, the audience. What is our responsibility as Americans to ethically engage in developing, developing countries who are most susceptible to climate change effect, but don't have the means right now to, be, to be respond to it? What is, what is the most reliable approach? through international development without risk, risk colonialism? Um, so that's a great question. I'm so glad you picked that question. So we, we in wealthy countries, especially the 12 wealthiest countries in the world have caused most of the problem. And in fact, just you know, 90 corporations have caused 60% of the problem. The 3.5 billion poorest people in the world have contributed 7% of global carbon emissions, 7%. So there is a huge disparity between who's responsible and who isn't. What can we do for people who are bearing the brunt of the impacts? The Paris Agreement, we often think of the Paris Agreement as what wealthy countries have to do to reduce their emissions, right? But there's a second half to the Paris Agreement, it's called the Green Climate Fund. And that's where the wealthy countries are paying into a fund to support resilience and adaptation in low-income countries. And I'm sorry to say that almost no country is paying what they promised to pay. Not the United States, not my home country of Canada, not the UK. I think there's, I think, I'm not quite sure. I think it was Norway who's paid what they promised to pay. So that is a big problem. And what we also need to do is we need to be investing in a lot of organizations like the Red Cross and the Nature Conservancy that I work for myself, um, you know, even faith-based organizations like World Vision and Compassion International, they're recognizing climate change is the hole in the bucket. And they have to account for climate impacts in their work to make sure that people have enough food to eat and have clean water and have a safe place to live because climate change is profoundly unfair and we need to put all of the resources we can into helping the people who are already bearing the brunt of the impacts today. And the good news is a lot of organizations are doing that, but they need your support. So I would encourage people to find an organization that's working in climate change resilience in low-income neighborhoods right here in the US or low-income countries and follow them on social media. 
there's great organizations on Instagram, on Twitter, on, you know, on LinkedIn. I'm not sure about TikTok. I haven't found any good ones there yet, but they, they probably are. Share their information. Use your voice to amplify their voice. Find out what they're doing, support what they're doing, um, and really help spread that awareness. All right, Lisa, I'm sorry, you're up next. I didn't give you enough heads up, but hopefully you have a good question. I do. I have kind of a favorite one. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to riff only a tiny bit on this one as I pull it up here. Um, the question is, what is your favorite geoengineering technique or which do you believe to be most plausible? And the reason I ask is we've talked in class a little bit about um, the immediacy, the urgency, and the IPCC report that said, now we have to think about how we suck carbon out of the out of the atmosphere. So I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about your thoughts on, on geoengineering, keeping in mind there are different kinds. Yes, and we have a global weirding episode on geoengineering. So I would encourage you to check that out too. They're these short little videos, seven or eight minutes long. When we say geoengineering, people usually think of the geoengineering that's called solar radiation management, which is mimicking the effect of a big volcanic eruption. When we have a huge volcanic eruption that only happens, you know, every 30, 40, 50 years, not like a little one, but a really big one, it spews all these particles up into the upper atmosphere where they act like an umbrella temporarily reflecting the sun's energy back to space, which cools us down a little bit for, you know, months, maybe a year. So people are talking about what if we did that all the time? Well, it would reflect the sun's energy back to space. It's actually not that high tech. We know it would work for that. But it would not fix all the carbon that is acidifying our oceans and decreasing the nutritional quality of our plants. It would not fix the changes in precipitation patterns we've seen. And if we stopped doing it, we would see this step function of warming that would basically be the end of human civilization as we know it. I mean, talk about the massive risks we'd be incurring. We'd make ourselves so vulnerable that if we ever stopped, that would be it. So it is really risky. And so then people say, well, maybe we shouldn't do any geoengineering at all. But I say, oh, no, there's lots of geoengineering that is great. And we should be doing it. And they're like, OK, well, do you mean the high tech artificial trees where we suck carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into, into a carbon neutral fuel? And I say, well, that's a great solution. And I wish we could do that at scale. But right now, it's way too expensive. My favorite type of geoengineering is this incredible piece of technology. You know where I'm going with this called photosynthesis. <laughs> it's been around for billions of years. And it is the way that plants by growing take carbon out of the atmosphere. It is revolutionary. So by investing in nature, and I don't mean just tree planting, tree planting is the smallest piece of the pie. I mean, protecting ecosystems, conserving forests and gra grasslands, restoring degraded forests and grasslands, restoring coastal marshes and peatlands, which are like super carbon soakers. And by helping farmers put carbon back into the soil where it's incredible fertilizer for their plants through cover crops, regenerative agriculture, through all kinds of different techniques, including the agroforestry I talked about that they were doing in Africa, we could suck up to a third of the carbon we produce out of the atmosphere in a way that would give us healthier ecosystems, healthier forests, healthier grasslands, healthier coastal wetlands, and healthier agricultural soils. Talk about a win, 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 win. And in fact, in my home country of Canada, agricultural solutions are more than half of the piece of the pie. It isn't tree planting, it's agricultural solutions. In the US, there's a lot of room to restore ecosystems, there's some room to plant trees, and there's a lot we can do with agriculture. So when we talk about deliberately engineering the planet, if we do so with nature rather than against nature, every single one of us wins. All right, All right. Have, I've got another one we, for you. Yes, go ahead. Can I, yes, can I offer can. one? This is a great one from the audience. As a professor of political science and public policy, how do you think public policy needs to change to address climate change? Mm -hmm. Further, what steps do we need to take to achieve policy reform in a highly divided political landscape like that of the United States? Well, if I knew the answer to that last question, <laughs> I think I'd be able to solve a lot of the world's problems. <laughs> I don't. But I can tell you for the first question, I do know the problem we've had. And that is we have viewed climate change as a separate issue. So we're trying to work on 
socioeconomic inequality. We're trying to work on jobs. We're trying to work on revitalizing, you know, rural areas. We're trying to work on, you know, advancing technology. We're trying to work on all these different things. And then here's climate change. The only reason we care about climate change is because it interacts with and exacerbates every single other thing. It's what the, the military calls a threat multiplier. It's what I call a hole in the bucket. We need to integrate climate solutions, which are cutting, stopping to put carbon in the atmosphere, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and building resilience to the impacts that are already here, those three things. We need to integrate them into our job plans, into our infrastructure development, into our health plans, into every single piece of policy we do because our planet climate is changing faster than any time in the history of human civilization on this planet. Our entire infrastructure, all of our infrastructure, our homes, our roads, our buildings, our electricity and our energy and our water systems and our ag systems, they are all built for a planet that no longer exists. We cannot make plans for the future anymore that do not incorporate climate change. And so we're starting to see this with the Build Back Better bill and the infrastructure bill. We're starting to see that people are recognizing that they need to full climate change in to job plans, into infrastructure plans, into economic revitalization plans. That is what we need to do because we live on such a rapidly changing planet. And how do we start to get people to agree on divisive issues like climate change? I truly believe that we start, and this is for politicians as well as for people, politicians are people, um, start by what we share, by what we have in common, by what we both want. Because if let's start at the highest level. We all want a better future. Let's go down a level. We all want clean water to come out of the tap when we turn it on. We want everybody else to have that too. We think they should. We want people to have enough food. We want a safe place to live. We want a decent jobs. You know, we want a secure world without the terrible wars that we're experiencing right now today. We all really want that. And then we disagree on how to get there. But if we can start with what we want, and then we can say, okay, well, I think we should do this. And I think we should do this but we want to get here. So what if we did a little bit here? What if we did a little bit here? You start to see that we can find points of agreement. And on climate change, there's actually a bipartisan climate solutions caucus in both the House and the Senate, which is really amazing. And that is one of the things that gives me hope. It's nowhere near where it needs to be. And I truly believe that cities, states, and companies are moving the needle much faster than the federal government. And we are seeing policy in the city of Houston. We are seeing policy in the state of New York. We are seeing policy in Walmart and Microsoft and Amazon that will change federal government policy. But the policies are starting in the cities, the states, and the companies, and then they're going up to the federal government. But we are seeing those changes happening right now. So if you just focus on the federal government, often you feel like we're just in permanent deadlock. But if you look below the level of a federal government, change is happening faster now than it ever has. We have about... Sorry, Lisa, we have five minutes left. So maybe Lisa, if you wanna get in one more question and then uh, Professor Hayhoe, if you have any closing thoughts, that will, that will be a wrap for us. Okay. Um, so uh, another question is how you remain optimistic and you've touched on this a little bit. I'm wondering about the role of faith in your optimism and how you, how you stay positive uh, in the face of, of all that you know Mm -hmm. And if you have any advice for those that don't feel a particular faith, if there's anything trans that you can transport there, Definitely. advice. That's a great question to end on, actually, because I started to notice about a year and a half ago that wherever I've been speaking the last four or five years, no matter who I've been speaking to, whether to college or university, whether to government officials or a community group or a bunch of you know, people in industry or a faith group, no matter where I've been speaking, I started to get the same two questions. And those questions were, what gives you hope? And how do I have a conversation about this? So this is really sort of the perfect note to end on. That's exactly why I wrote my book. And again, I actually didn't talk about my book during this talk, but the reason why I wrote this book, which is called Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. And oh, get a free book right there if you click on that. Um, it's also a audio book that I read myself and it is a um, Kindle or an ebook too. The reason I wrote it is to answer those two questions. What gives you hope and how do we talk about it? So let me give you that in a nutshell. Hope does not find us. If we sit there waiting for hope, it will not find us. 
We have to roll up our sleeves and go out and look for it and practice it. Hope comes when we see that we're not alone. Hope comes when we recognize that we can make a difference. Hope comes when we see others acting and we know that we can act too. Hope does not begin in a good place. As a Christian, um, I think there's some very interesting things the Bible says about hope. And one of the things it says is um, it talks about suffering. And it begins with suffering. It says suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope that will not disappoint because of what? Because of love. What we're fighting for is really and truly the people we love, the places we love, the things that we love. And so part of my practice of hope, and it is a practice that you have to decide, I'm going to go out, I'm going to look for what other people are doing. I'm going to go out and do things myself and share what I'm doing with other people. And I'm going to make sure I spend time with the people I love in the places I love doing the things that I love, because that is why we're all, every single one of us fighting for a better world. Thank you so much. That This was, has been such a, a pleasure of a way to spend uh, some time today. And I really do encourage audience members to go out and uh, read Saving Us. It, it's um, just a, a really helpful, hopeful book. I also encourage you to watch the TED Talk um, and to look for other examples in the media of uh, how Professor Heho is, is spending her time and living out her most important values. So thank you very much. And audience members, I will see you next Thursday, uh, March 24th, for the final lecture in our series this year uh, with Mark Coddington. So thanks so much. Have a good night, everybody.